When you assess the reliability of your scales or your measures, there are two steps in the process. First, you need to calculate the statistic that quantifies reliability and then you need to interpret the, the calculation result. So if you have coefficient alpha of 0 0.75, what does that actually mean? And that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. There are some concerns in, in journals that authors who try to submit articles to these journals are using reliability statistics rather mechanically. So this is an example from Guide and Keto Kivi editorial from Journal of Operations Management. And these co-editors are uh, explain that quite commonly people are uh, interpret reliability coefficients by simply checking if the coefficient is more than 0 0.7 and they cite an analyst book from 1994 or uh, perhaps 1978, which is a bit more common. So uh, what's the problem with this, this strategy? Well, the first, there are two problems. The analyst book citation here does not have a page number. And if you actually go and look what that book says, it does not recommend uh, a specific cutoff that is great for every possible scenario. The second thing is that reliability is not a yes or no question, but it's to a degree. And uh, you need to evaluate what does the specific number mean in your context. Sometimes high reliability is required, sometimes not so. What does Nanali say? Well, Nanali does not specifically say that 0.7 is always acceptable. Instead, he recommends that uh, for very early research, 0.7 may be okay if you have uh, like uh, a more refined and developed theory that you're testing, then 0.90 may be required. And uh, typically when authors try to uh, submit papers to journals, they just pick the lowest number out of convenience. Many probably have not read about this, uh, read this segment of the book or seen the book, they just cite it out of habit. So that's one thing. Nanali does not really uh, say that 0.7 is always okay, but it depends on the context. But there's also a more general problem. The more general problem is that why would we care what a psychologist said 40 years ago? So uh, this is Nanali's personal subjective opinion 40 years ago in the context of psychology. Why would what was okay for psychologists based on one person's opinion 40 years ago be relevant for other disciplines now. And maybe there are better benchmarks than this benchmark that we could apply. This is something that uh, this editorial in Journal of Operations Management tries to address. So they are saying that instead of uh, relying on this rule of thumb and they are actually uh, pointing to the uh, page number where readers can see for themselves what Nunnall is recommending and that's, uh, that's a very good idea to do. They're saying that you, you should contextualize and this is not uh, the only editorial that I've seen that calls for contextualizing uh, the reliability coefficients or generally any, any statistics. The problem is that none of these editorials that I've read actually explain how should you contextualize. How do you actually make a contextual assessment of the reliability coefficients? There does not seem to be much guidelines on that. Well, well Nunnally's book actually uh, has a chapter on assessment of reliability. And he talks about some uh, strategies for how to estimate, how to interpret the reliability coefficient in context. And, uh, but this, this does not really, uh, it's not very modern source anymore. So the uh, field has advanced beyond this book. There are basically two ways of assessing reliability. The first strategy is to estimate how much bias the degree of unreliability is expected to have on your results. And to do so, you can use errors in variables regression analysis. If you don't have a statistical software that contains an errors in variables procedure, you can do that with structural regression modeling software by fixing the error variances to, to uh, the reliability estimates and or correct correlations for attenuation using this formula here. One problem with these strategies is that the reliabilities are, are estimates. So there's uncertainty and uh, taking that uncertainty of the estimate into account 
in, in the correction, it's actually uh, it's quite difficult to do. But nevertheless, even if your standard errors for the cor correlation corrected for attenuation would be uh, slightly too small, the correlation is useful or errors in variables is useful to give you kind of like a, a what if scenario. What if uh, my reliability estimates are correct and uh, what would the result of the analysis be in that case? So um, you understand, uh, you should also understand what the reliability index quantifies. So beyond coefficient alpha, for example, if you use one of these multidimensional indices, then uh, depending on which one you apply, you will get a different result for the corrected correlations or corrected regressions. And you need to understand what the reliability indices quantify to understand uh, which should be applicable. Should you use test retest reliability index or these uh, internal consistency in indices and, and so on. One thing is clear, you should never use a lower bound estimate. So uh, for example, the, the greatest lower bound using that, it's, it's going to underestimate reliability. And if you underestimate reliability, then you are overcorrecting the regression estimates for, for unreliability. Same with coefficient alpha, it tends to underestimate reliability unless the tau equivalence assumption holds. And if so, then you are overcorrecting, which means that you're overestimating the, correct, uh, the correlations. So this is one strategy. Calculate a model that takes the reliability estimates into account and corrects the regression estimates based on those reliability estimates. The second strategy is uh, use contextual benchmarks. For example, you can check, compare your reliability estimates against reliability estimates calculated from the prior applications of the same measure, or you can calculate prior, uh, compare against prior measures, different measures of the same constructs, prior applications of similar measures of similar constructs in your domain, or reliability levels that are typical for research that is on the same level of maturity as your study is. So instead of looking at what is what was Nanali's opinion 40 years ago, you look at what are the uh, typical reliability levels in your field now and then you make a comparison. So is your reliability better or worse and after that you need to explain. So if reliability is typically assessed and it's let's say it's 0.75 and then you get a 0.95 reliability. Then you need to explain why is there a difference. Also you need to obviously uh, explain differences to the other directions. So if others uh, have reliabilities of 0.85 and you get 0.65 then you need to explain what is the reason. And remember that reliability depends on, on two different things. It depends on the sample variance of true scores. So if you have a um, low reliability, it does not mean necessary that your measurements are imprecise. It can also mean that the total variation in, in the sample is very small, which means that the relative precision which reliability in this is quantified is, is small. So it does not mean that there's more error variance in any absolute sense, but it's about the relationship between the true score variance and the error variance. And both of course affect the reliability statistics. My recommendation is that you should always apply both of these strategies. So even if you don't use an error in errors in variables regression or structural regression model in as your main analysis technique, it's a useful way of doing kind of like a robustness check or a what if analysis. So what would the results be if reliability was corrected and uh, if the results are, are very different from your original results, then you have some explaining to do in your study. And also comparing against past practice is always a, a good idea.